like, but we are very good in sticking to the rules. So we may not like it, we may be grumpy, but we like. So um, I spent a number of years in racing where I learned one important thing that you are doing over here. The race is on Sunday, it doesn't matter what happens. Some people say the show must go on, pretty much that is the thing. So you need to be there on Sunday. We draw or not being there or thinking, oh, I'm not good enough is not acceptable. So you do your job and you are there. And all these helped me in moving through a highly regulated environment, um, like cars, the car need to be launched on that day and it has to fulfill all the safety criteria and all the durability tests. Not getting on that day means a massive loss for, for your business, the business is giving you um, that is giving you some cash. Same is for, for the, the, the place where I am at the moment. We need to be there when we commit it to our, to our customers to deliver uh, the power unit. So if they need to have a test flight or they need to have an activity, our product needs to be with them because otherwise we'll disrupt a lot of other things that come together. So that thing of not being late, uh, that doing everything right, everything at the best that we can do, not cutting corner, being incredibly tough with our integrity uh, is something that it came from my beginning in the racing and is still with me, and you can take it across. Um, you may or may not have done other competition with your university. Uh, the design challenge is possibly or probably one of the first time where you put together cross-functional skills, some people management, managing BOM, which is managing cost to deliver a project. In most of your other subjects, you e analyze only one of those. So you need to deliver a project, you need to do a product. Putting together all of these in time with the cost target is a problem with the team of people you may have not been working with. So get, all, get you in very, very short time all the skills that you will develop in future in your career. So it's very, it's very interesting to me to see students competing. Only one will win. That is the nature of the competition. But Please enjoy and take them and make the most and meet people and talk to them during this event. Um, engineers are here to solve the problems and to improve our life. But what can we, what can we, what did we learn in the last years, uh, and how we can change, uh, uh, how we can change the future with our stuff? Um, one of the message and and why I'm so pedantic with you when I review your, your devices about the execution is if you do it right in CAD, highly likely you waste less energy and less resources when you're doing your prototype. So learn to do a good design, a good solid design, and focus in the execution on the area that you cannot design. There are things that you cannot really design or they will be too time consuming to design, so then you focus those as a risk. Uh, I don't know what is the coefficient of friction of the wheels, but I needed to calculate which motor I need. Let's start with an assumption and focus one of your tests to verify if the coefficient of friction is right or wrong, so that then your load may come together. I don't know what is the mass of my device, so how much will my chassis deflect? Well, I start with an assumption, and then I will mature everything. When I finish my design, first I will check my CAD, what is the mass of my CAD, and then I will build and verify if my actual vehicle has exactly the same mass. So try to focus on what you cannot design and focus your time and your execution and the use of energy and resources only to fix the problems that you cannot design out. That will help us being faster in the future and as well use less energy, less resources. Now from university and then into the, into the work environment to really uh, contribute to our, to our uh, planet to make it better. Um, a little bit of, of things that I'm hoping that you have already seen it, uh, at university. But uh, uh, there are a few, a few things that in the design challenge you will explore. Maybe you didn't thought about that one, so I thought it was nice to do uh, some numbers. So the design challenge is a project with some requirements. You, you pass from the verification, which is read the regulation, and check, yes, with my concept I could do what the regulation is doing there. Then you do the validation, so you actually mature your CAD, and every time you go through it, you say, right, uh, yes, my device still do the job in the two minutes, or can go from A to B and coming back from to A. And then you build and you confirm that your, uh, that your product is accurate. Then there are a couple of things where most of the times uh, students uh, don't, uh, don't get the exposure, so which is the real world, the world of tolerance. So one is uh, uh, the durability. Your device needs to do 
an activity, so bounce against the wall. It has to bounce against the wall at least uh, three times in the heat and three times for the, for the final if you get there. So it has to do three cycle, six cycles. Then you need to do all your testing that you want to do. Say that you test another 20 runs. Eventually, with the same device, you go to the national. So let's call it that uh, other five test just to be safe, and then six when you're in the final. So the minimum that your vehicle needs to withstand is, call it 30, 35 heat against the wall. Um, it has to withstand those. If it falls apart halfway through, it's not, it's not durable enough. And the other thing is where uh, it becomes a little bit more difficult is the robustness. The best product is the one that could be used by any operator on any surface in any environment and still do exactly the same job. So if your vehicle works only on that surface because that coefficient of friction is perfect and only with the Joe operating it and when James operates it, it doesn't work, then it's not a robust product. So think about tolerances. All your wheels are going to be slightly different. All your rubbers are going to be slightly different. Imagine to put all of this together and still do the job and still get to the end point. Uh, that is one of the little things that you will learn, unfortunately, probably the hard way with the design challenge, but is a direct transposition of what you will find in, uh, in, in life. And then, and for me, thank you very much for coming and let's enjoy the design challenge. Thank you, David, that was a great talk. I would like also to call now uh, our professor, uh, Simon Philbin, interim dean of the School of Engineering, to give the formal welcome to LSBU. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and I'd like to welcome everybody to London South Bank University. And yes, my name is Simon Philbin. I'm professor and interim dean of the School of Engineering and delighted that you're competing here in the second day of, of the competitions. And um, of course, this is the, the IMECI design challenge, the GLR, uh, the advanced finals. Um, now, I must admit, I'm, I'm not a design engineer myself. Um, originally, I did chemistry um, and then moved into different areas of engineering. But of course, we know that design is very important. And, and we will all be acutely aware of this. Design is needed to address you know, many problems within society that, that many of us face. Tackling difficult problems, intractable um, problems where there's complexity attached to them. It may be a case of improving the user experience, which is a, a, a key requirement for design. It may be generating solutions which are more efficient, more effective, more economical, or even more ethical. There are a range of different reasons for, for having effective design, but also, of course, it's a way of harnessing and channeling creativity. And so engineering structures and systems and processes are all important, but it's it, having that ability then to take that idea forward, channel that creativity. And indeed, you know, there are many opportunities for design to be applied, especially in the world that we live in. If we think about the big grand challenges, the need to move towards net zero targets, to implement renewable energy technologies, the United Nations SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And then also, you know, the challenges around digital transformation. And people say that we're in the midst of a, a fourth industrial revolution, Industry 4.0. So many challenges and opportunities for engineers to work on, on design and uh, design initiatives. So I'd like to take this opportunity as well to thank all of the organizers involved in this event, uh, Elisa Pucinelli and uh, colleagues from London South Bank University helping out over the last two days. I'd like to thank our head judge, David Migliorini. Um, thank you for the uh, introduction you gave as well. And also representatives from the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. But for, finally, I'd like to thank you all for actually you know, stepping up and uh, coming along today for this competition. And uh, finally, good luck to all of you. I hope you have a really good day. Thank you, Simon.
Okay, um, just a bit of uh, initial notes before we start. I'm starting talking how we're going to run the competition today. Uh, earlier on, we had a fire drill, yeah, but in case we ha you hear a fire alarm, uh, the way to, to evacuate is just going straight on those corridors here, and then security is going to be waiting for us at the start uh, just to help us um, evacuate the building safely. Right, I would like to thank you again for those uh, that volunteered as um, lane judges. Okay, Martin again, your second day, thank you very much. Peter, my colleague, Juan, Paula, and uh, also Bridget. Paula is there, thank you. Uh, Bridget as well, thank you very much for doing that. All right, so how are we going to run the competition today? Okay, so the first element of the competition is going to be the presentation competition. So the three top teams are coming here and are going to give their presentation live. Uh, and then we we'll, can have some questions from the audience uh, about their presentation, followed by the design review. So the three top scoring teams for the card are going to have their card models projected here on the screen. And then this will be led by a head judge. He's going to be making comments about your card models. Uh, just after that, we got uh, something very exciting uh, today, which is the ANSYS simulation challenge brought uh, to us by Bridget from ANSYS. Uh, so she will announce which are the team's uh, finalists to go to the final for this challenge. After that, we will break for lunch. And during lunch break, we are going to be, uh, the judges are going to scrutinize your devices, okay? And say you're ready to go to compete on the, competi on the land competitions, okay? And also, doing that at the same time, you are going to be doing the peer review. So we'll give you a slip of paper so you can go around and vote do you th which uh, you think is the best team, okay? After that, um, straight after, we will start the challenge competition. So we are going to be moving to the lanes and we will start what we are really expecting to see your devices working on the lanes. Uh, after the, this, we, the judges, we are going to be doing the briefing, is scoring the, summing all the, the scorings to see who is gonna go for the grand final. And on the grand final, the finalists are going to compete head to head. And then uh, they, the judges will deliberate and we will have finally the prize giving, okay? At the end of, of the day, don't forget, there will be some refreshments and snacks, beer and wine for you to celebrate at the end, okay? All right, so, so let's start with the presentation. I would like to call here the first team to present which will be, um, just one moment, UCLC, can you please come and present for us? Can we have a round of applause for them? Hi, hi everyone, we're team UCLC an extracurricular team of second year students competing in the advanced category of the 2024 iMakey Design Challenge. So, our project involves in building a repeatable device simulating an autonomous vehicle transporting goods. As shown in the video here, our starting point is set at the first target, with the second target being set 1.4 to 4 meters ahead. Uh, the vehicle must then move forwards, go past the second target, touch the wall, reverse, and return to the first target. Um, staying there for about five to 10 seconds. It must then advance towards and stop at the second target all within a two minute time frame. In our mechanical design process, we first focus on defining the robot's dimension and wheel geometry. By modeling the turning radius versus wheelbase to track width ratio, we determined that maximizing the length to the competition regulation was crucial. We then adjusted the width through iterative physical prototyping until resulting in a 395 by 350 millimeter configuration. Additionally, we ran spring and friction calculations to reduce tire slip, uh, leading to the incorporation of a 3D printed spring to minimize collision impulse, as well 
as nitrile rubber O-rings for tie grip. Uh, the wheels were planned to have uh, ac accurate laser cut acrylic inners sandwiched by weighty water jet cut steel outers for precise vehicular performance. Um, we wanted to do water jet steel cutting because it provides steel cheap components with no additional iMickey manufacturing costs. However, since our university workshops, uh, water jet cutter broke down and it was not repaired in time, today we will be competing with all acrylic wheels. Uh, the wheels are connected by a flange coupler to a six millimeter stainless steel shaft, which proved to exhibit minimal deflection after beam bending calculations. Um, we then conducted tool calculations and um, periods of acceleration as well as constant speed were looked at, whereby approximately 0.1 newton meters of torque was required by the motor. Um, this also ensured no traction loss. We then chose the stepper motor. This provided um, more accurate incremental movements as well as the torque provided by the motor sufficient um, for the amount required by the motor to propel the vehicle. For our driver, we chose um, one that would allow for a quarter micro step in. Again, this increased the resolution and so was more, uh, allowed for more accurate um, rotation as well. For the sensor, we opted for an infrared sensor. Um, this provided a more consistent and discrete response to the target's back boundary, as opposed to the color sensor. Um, by the side, you can actually see the serial outputs for both components. For the battery um, drainage calculations, we assumed the stepper motor coils draw, drew around 900 milliamps of current, and with our battery capacity being around 550 milliamp hours, this meant around 18 complete runs could be um, conducted without actually having to swap in the batteries. And for our PCB, we decided, we decided to opt for our custom PCB design. This greatly reduced the amount of wires used, as well as actually um, allowed better signal reliability because fewer connections were actually lost as well. Our code implements a speed ramp technique to ensure smooth velocity profile and minimize motor wear. As the vehicle approaches the wall's minimum distance from the second target, the speed gradually reduces in order to uh, minimize the impulse at the wall. The speed has been selected suitably such that the vehicle completes its run in just under two minutes for the most extreme case. The bullseye location is determined based off two observations of the target boundary. The IR sensor identifies the foremost and rearmost points of the target in, on consecutive approaches, and then the average of that value of those two locations determines the bullseye location. If the vehicle approaches at a horizontal offset, uh, this method prevents the additional vertical misalignment that would be caused had the vehicle just traversed the radius length past the foremost point. Uh, also, the averaging technique uh, prevents any uh, cancels out the systematic errors uh, in perceived position due to sensor lag and mitigates the effects of sensor noise. As per IMICI regulations, the budget was limited to under 80 pounds. By keeping track of all incurred costs, total expenses, excluding items under 20p, the IMICI bill of materials costs reached 75.01, with the total cost being at 81.40. The excess percentage of the total cost was at 8.53%, which is less than a maximum of 10%, satisfying the rules. We first allocated budget to crucial components, such as the motor, and then took full use of the remaining budget by implementing additional features, such as a 7 second display for debugging and voltmeters for checking battery charge, which enhances the user interface. As for future improvements, we are looking to introduce an adaptive speed feature, which allows the vehicle to complete its run in just under two minutes in any case, to reduce the total path deviation. This will be achieved by adjusting speed depending on remaining time, distance to the wall, and distance to the second target. One issue we can also address is a slight horizontal misalignment present during testing. Therefore, we also plan to implement a lead screw gantry system that will horizontally move the data pointer and IR sensor, improving robustness. We plan to make budget for this by reducing the ch chassis dimensions and removing the laser pointer assembly as minor vehicle misalignment would not matter anymore. Just a little technical problem here. <laughs> okay. 
Um, currently, our device satisfies both cost and runtime constraints uh, while consistently scoring near maximum points. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Your design shows a gap or a specific left void uh, in the regulation. So we don't specify that the datum pointer needs to be fixed to the frame. And you're probably the first team that discovered that providing the datum point is there and is always attached to the frame, it fulfills the regulation. So clearly you read the regulation and you, and you find a product that fulfills them and, and could deliver the job. Uh, budget is on budget, well, well done. Um, a, couple of mo uh, a couple of comments, I would have I would have liked more in the presentation to introduce the challenge. So you jump to the vehicle is doing this. Uh, so there was no why at the beginning. And the other thing is that uh, uh, I understand where you focused, but it was not clear how you got to the point of finalizing your design. So there are elements of uh, why you choose um, rear wheel drive instead of front wheel drive, why you choose uh, uh, to position the battery there, why you choose uh, a square base and not rectangular. So there was no evidence of you doing the brainstorming to analyze and challenge ideas and come out with a scoring matrix over there. Uh, have you done anything like that? These questions now. Um, so I think one of your first points was why we chose to do a uh, front wheel drive instead of a rear wheel drive. Um, that's because when we're positioning the, that's when we're positioning the, um, vehicle, um, we want to have the datum pointer on the white dot, and then we want to pivot it around that white dot um, to align it perfectly so that it's, uh, it's collinear with the second target. Um, we're able to do that on, while pivoting it around the back wheels, but that would have caused an issue if we had a uh, rear wheel drive. Um, yeah. Additionally, we'd like to point out that at first, we made, we made like a minimal viable product, which was just like a motor, a wheels, and then we tested how we, we shifted the weight distribution on purpose. We tried wheel, 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 wheel drive, forefront front wheel drive, see how it affected, and we didn't really see much difference, and that's why we ended up with the configuration right now um, after physical prototyping. I just wondered if you could comment on your design methodology that you used. You, you mentioned MVP, for example. I mean, what were the, the key stages that you went through? Um, so first we uh, did calculations to spec a motor, batteries, so on, the crucial components, electric components, and then we made a MVP, as you said. Um, from there, we saw what parameters really affected performance. So was it wheel diameter, was it the wheelbase um, length, so on. And from there, we kind of narrowed it down, uh, our design. And then finally, we added um, additional components uh, to fulfill the remaining budget that complements user interface, such as the display, uh, checking battery capacity, and so on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, that was a very good presentation. You all uh, had something to contribute, but um, Part of, uh, an important part of a challenge like this is working on a project as a team. So could you describe how you work together as a team and how you divide your responsibilities and if any of you had any, any kind of leadership and organizing roles? Yeah, so um, of course in teamwork like this we had to distribute the workload. Um, so there were areas such as um, working on the electrical aspect of the vehicle, um, areas working on the mechanical design aspect of the vehicle, um, then you also had the calculations, um, as you've seen there, for example, the torque required to spec the motor, um, the battery, for example. Um, yeah, I'm looking at, for example, how much uh, current that motor drew to then decide what batteries to use to be able to power the vehicle. And then you also had the other aspects, you know, um, creating the uh, bill of materials as well. That's important as well to be able to see if we actually meet the requirements. So, yeah, in terms of the tasks, um, that's how we separated it out. Um, we also did the sign a team leader as well to be able to actually 
separate out the tasks, but as well, it's always good to have a team leader to be able to see, you know, where the team is and, you know, to always keep on constant communication. So that's something we did consider, something that we did implement as well, to be able to, you know, provide a, a working vehicle as well as have all the required, you know, documents and, and, and yeah, documents and so forth to be able to be prepared for the competition. So, yeah, that was, that was, that was carried out. Thank you very much, UCLC. Great presentation, great work. Thank you. Can I have here UCLD, please? Hi, we're Team UCLD, and this is how we designed and manufactured our repeatable vehicle. So as you all know, the competition states that we have to start at one target, drive towards the wall, reverse once we hit that wall to the first target again, and then drive forward to the second target. Um, the requirements also state we need to stay within an 80-pound budget. Um, we cannot change anything once uh, we put our vehicle down in the track, and we have to fit within a 400 by 400 by 400 millimeter dimension. Uh, to tackle these problems, uh, we first prototyped with uh, a, a real-wheel drive we realized, and a pulley system. We realized this could cause a lot of slip and pro possibly not enough power to the wheels as we have um, manufactured our own uh, steel wheels to ensure a stable and um, uh, linear uh, drive. We then, in our second prototype, we had a, a gear system with a full-wheel drive to um, allow the car to uh, go forward and backwards uh, safely without any misalignment. Our final design consisted of um, two spoilers, we call it, to uh, cover the gears and the electronics and to also have enough space to fit everything on the board. We also, as you can see in the engineering drawings, stay within our dimension constraints of 400 by 400 by 400 millimeters. Um, yeah. We implemented a gear ratio of 2 to 1 to ensure that the vehicle travels slowly with an increased torque. The gears are locked into place on the shaft using grub screws to prevent the gears from slipping and misaligning. They are manufactured uh, with 3D printing with 0.2 millimeter tolerance and 100% infill. We decided to 3D print as such off-the-shelf off um, gears will not fit onto the shaft. We also implemented chevron teeth pattern to prevent axial slip. We, our four wheels um, have 75 millimeter diameters. They're made of steel and are fitted onto eight millimeter diameter aluminum shafts. They are thick and heavy, which uh, ensure that the vehicle travels in a straight line and are manufactured using CNC laves. The rear and front wheels are also tightly secured onto the shaft with nuts on either side. The front and rear spoilers both include flange bearings to reduce friction on the axles. The LCD on top of the front spoiler keeps track of the distance and the color detected by the color sensor. And the rear spoiler supports the breadboard and rocker switch. The front spoiler weighs 67 grams while the rear spoiler weighs 144 grams. We determine the current draw from each of the electrical components and determined that a one amp fuse was sufficient to ensure that the circuit is safely used. From the graph, uh, we uh, discovered that a single 1.5 volt AA battery is expected to last three hours. We also create a wiring diagram to keep track of how all our components will be connected. It also allows our other team members to work on the electronics, so any wrong or faulty connections can be avoided. It also allows us to test the device over several iterations, and it allows us to edit the wiring if needed. For our reverse mechanism, we're using an ultrasonic sensor attached to the front of the vehicle. This sensor detects the distance from the wall and reduces impact at 15 centimeters uh, from the wall. And this is done using PWM control with a duty cycle of 512, which reduces the speed by 50%. An SPD2 switch is used to reverse the device. These are conventionally held down to reverse, but we've programmed it to act like a DBDT. At this point, the Raspberry Pi would record the number of forward revolutions and then do the same going backwards, which ensures we are as close as possible to hitting bullseye. To stop at the second target, we're using a color sensor that activates after the five second pause. This sensor detects blue and stops the vehicle after a time delay. We figured out this time delay just by completing tests, so we, complete, uh, so we, so we always hopped in between the testing and design stages during the iteration process. 
For our programming, we completed all the programming using CircuitPython. We used the async I.O. library, which allows us to use multitask, which allows us to create multitasking programs. This allows this system section to occur as the number of revolutions is counted, and a section of our code shows how we implement the five second pause and stop and start the motors. So we then set about creating an anal uh, analytical solution on Excel, and a short snippet is shown on the slide. To, make, to increase the reliability and accuracy, we decided to include drag and rolling resistance into our calculations. And this led to the following graphs from our Excel. So theoretically, the car, um, starting from four meters, uh, a maximum four meters, four meters distance, will take approximately 13.5 seconds to complete the entire challenge. And then finally, our final weight and cost. So the total weight of the vehicle is approximately two kilograms. And the most expensive components are the motor driver and the wheels. But all in all, it all comes underneath um, the, the, the total cost required. Thank you so much for listening today. And any questions? Thank you, very, very clear presentation. So I really appreciated that you put the introduction of the presentation and you show your, your thought process. I have a couple of questions here. Uh, so one, you had a good idea. Uh, having light wheels is okay for racing. In these, having heavy wheels will help you to keep straight. Uh, so hopefully all the other colleagues and, uh, and somebody else will pick up on this, uh, on this thought that you had. But what about the friction? Because uh, still uh, wheel on a man-made uh, board may not have a great friction over there. So um, that is one of the things that sometimes create a little bit of, uh, of uh, uncertainty. Then in one of your circuits, you show that you had two electric motors, but on the product I see only one. So there is a circuit diagram where, where there were two motors, uh, and now, there is a, are you four-wheel drive with two motors? Uh, how, how? Yeah, so as you can see, so there's a motor attached to the rear axle and a motor to the front axle as well, so it's four-wheel drive system. Okay, so it would have been nicer to see your journey in rear-wheel drive, front-wheel drive, all-wheel drive, uh, and how you score the different ideas before actually going on CAD. Uh, and then one engineering bit. So your budget got very, very close to the edge, so you got 75 plus, uh, for the IMIKI budget, where the top is 80 quid. And you left in your device a display that is used only for your testing and development purposes. Now, something which is left in a product that does, is not needed to fulfill the mission may be a point of failure. In your case, the failure could have been running over budget, or the display start to be funny while you're using the device and uh, not allowing the, the, the device to uh, do the mission it would have been better to think about removing the display when you finish all your development, because it's not really needed there. Yeah. And that, that's it so for me. So uh, just, just in the future, think about the, the friction uh, in your contact. It may, be, it may be useful. Thank you for me as well. Um, you mentioned about making this choice between um, being able to buy a standard part or manufacture it yourself. Um, could you just explore a little bit more about your decision there? Because obviously, stand apart, perhaps may more certainty over the uh, performance and dimensions, making it yourself some uncertainty. Why couldn't you start with, well, I'll have one of those and design to the, to the standard product? Um, so one of, one of the, to address your point, especially with the gears, we could have easily bought those as well. Um, the reason we didn't is because, um, again, budget. And also, um, the way our motor shaft is, the, the shape of it, we wanted to design our own gears. And although off-the-shelf components might be a good choice, we would have had to add shaft extensions, which we didn't really want to do. We didn't really have the space for it either. Um, so we thought it would be a good idea to manufacture our gears. And we, we run so many tests on them. That was the whole point of... Um, just checking if these these if manufacturing is a is a good way to go, um, so we ran a lot of tests, a lot of iterations, and yeah, we were able to finalize our choice that this is a really cheap method and a reliable method of us um, uh, of us being able to complete the challenge without having to rely on industry standard parts as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, on one of your slides, you give a calculation of um, the time taken for your device to 
traverse four meters. Can you forward to that? Okay. Um, did you actually do any testing to, to, to validate and benchmark this uh, this time? Um, yeah. So this this, um, this these calculations that we only done were for the for going straight and not we didn't we didn't have the time to actually uh, simulate vehicle deceleration. So what we did was yeah we, we did test it in in real time as well. Um, I think there was a video there that showed us sh um, actually completing the challenge as well. And I think they were roughly similar. I think we got 11 seconds doing a normal test and from the theory side of things, we got 13 and a half seconds. So it was roughly, roughly similar. Um, I would assume that the, the differences were because um, obviously there are a lot of losses, uh, maybe, maybe slip as well. And um, again, we, our Excel model took into account a lot of assumptions because we didn't necessarily know our final vehicle mass or you know our final gear ratio we didn't really uh, we had to assume a lot of things with this excel model and then once we did um, finally manufacture our vehicle we were able to finalize um, and test and yeah we were quite close with our simulations as well Uh, hello. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, what development platform are you using? What, what development board are you using in your, in your design? <clears throat> what uh, development board? What microcontroller? Oh, um, we're using a Raspberry Pi Pico. Um. Yeah, because uh, in the CAD design, I saw the, the CAD was for the Raspberry Pico W. So yep. it doesn't match. The, is it, are you using the Pico W or the Pico? Uh, we're using just the Pico, yeah. A Pico, oh, yeah. yeah. In the CAD, you, you have the Pico W. So I was, I thought that maybe you, uh, you were using the Pico W, but if you're not using wireless functionality, then you don't need it. Okay, I, I, I'll have to double check. I'm not entirely sure which exactly we are using, but um, I'm pretty sure it's a Pico. Uh, okay. Thank you, Saudi. Thank you. All right, I would like to invite now to present for us Kingston A. Advanced. Very brave. Hi. Um, so, I can't promise that my presentation will be as beautiful as the one that the two UCL teams did, but um, anyway, uh, this is our repeatable vehicle design. Um, our CAD is quite simple. Um, it's just a three-wheel design, uh, which was chosen for the um, utility of, of uh, servo, uh, motor differential, um, where we could implement a um, code function that will realign the device if needed, um, if more accuracy is needed um, to, you know, to get on the bullseye. Um, so our design is made up of uh, two IR sensors. Well, used to be, uh, and I'll get into that. Um, a micro switch in order to uh, notice the, the wall when it makes contact with the wall. Uh, two, two ABYJ48 stepper motors. Uh, and an ultrasonic sensor, and it is using the microcontroller Arduino Uno Rev3. Um, the IR sensors were part of our first prototype, um, but we ended up switching it out for two LDR sensors. The reason for that was that the LDR sensors, um, they give you the, a very uh, accurate reading as to what um, color or what surface it is on top of. Um, so for that, we used it to uh, detect the outer ring of the uh, bullseyes. Um, so going from point A to the wall, um, going from point A to the wall, you run, at a, you run the steppers at full speed, um, and they're needed because they have a built-in encoder, which can keep track of the amount of steps that you've made um, for the distance from A to the wall. Uh, and it can just easily, through the Arduino IDE, coding it, um, and through the microcontroller, you can just input the same amount of steps in reverse to get um, quite accurately to uh, the starting position. Um, from there, uh, yeah, what you can see, 
This is the, the three-wheel design. Um, and we have the LDRs that go through these two slots there. Um, they have their own LEDs, so reading from the LDR should remain fairly consistent, um, no matter the lighting in the room, because they're, they're uh, I mean, yeah, they, they have their own lighting. Um, and it is a 20 by 23 centimeter design. Um, so this is roughly how, how our device works. This is with the IRs, but just imagine that it's the, uh, the light dependent resistors. Um, they're quite close to the ground, as you can see, because um, that is how you're going to get the most accurate reading. Um, and if you approach the bullseye, misaligned, you could use the uh, code in order to recognize whether one left LDR is, is switched, then maybe it needs to turn right, or if the right one is switched, then maybe it needs to turn left to, um, again, increase that accuracy. Um, so how much does it cost? Uh, with the IRs, we ended up getting to about 77 pound, um, which is really pushing it. Um, but uh, again, we decided to go with the LDRs, so it, it'll drop to about 75 pounds. Um, and yeah, I believe that is it. So if you have any questions or if I can expand more on the uh, device, then feel free. So very interesting design where you, are uh, where you thought about steering uh, uh, axle actively. So very, very good and, and almost like a self-driving uh, thing. Um, pretty much as a comment that I made uh, scattered uh, in the previous team, there was no introduction of the competition. So yep. you assume that your audi audience was already understanding what you were mm. talking about. If I need to buy this product, I don't know what I'm buying yeah. or why I'm buying it. Uh, second, again, relatively little evidence of why you got to the three wheel in this configuration, mm. why you got to the ball, why you got to the three wheel in, a different, in, in another configuration, and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, two things. You, rely, you say that you rely on the stepper motor on, um, to count back. Yeah. Uh, you need to be incredibly sure about the friction, because the step, if you have a slip, the stepper will count. Yes. But the vehicle don't move. Um, with the, with the uh, stepper motors that we have implemented, um, we can recognize, they do say uh, with the, the, just the product um, that it's likely to miss one or two steps. But overall, you're not missing out. And through testing, we've noticed that even if it does miss one or two steps, the uh, difference is not major to get completely off the bullseye. Um, and if you're running it at, what we, what we have now is, is a five volt power supply um, at 1,000 steps a second. Um, we get fairly decent and um, accurate stepping uh, count. So um, yeah, uh, we, we ended up with the, with the three wheel design mainly for that differential to, to make it a 360 degree turning radius because you can run one back, one, one stepper backwards, one stepper forwards and you just, you, you can remain on point. Turning radius. Uh, yeah, we, we went through a lot of ideation process where uh, we considered uh, what was crucial for the actual competition. And we originally did start with a, a four wheel design, but then we realized the, the turning radius was a big issue that uh, resulted in a lot of other further uh, ideas we had to solve. Um, and with a differential design, Obviously, it can just rotate on the spot. We don't have to uh, consider the, the size of the vehicle as much, and it simplifies a lot of the uh, the design process. Uh, the, the purpose of the competition is to buy a customer into your idea. So I need to see that you have evaluated their idea yeah, and why your idea yeah, is better. And at the same time, they, they evaluated something like your one, and they declare instead that their idea is better. Mm -hmm. So the idea of, of showing your customer the screening mm -hmm. process is right there. Why I need to buy your car if their car does a job exactly the same? Yeah. Yeah. Another thing, um, and that is where uh, I'm even a little bit less, uh, more grumpy than normal. You declared a bomb, but there was no delta between the IMECI bomb, which is the one without uh, the 20p components and the, and the uh, overall we one. We have included well, both. Uh, and then you declared, uh, you declared that you are changing the sensors. So. 
Yeah. Which bomb am I looking in this presentation? Which product am I going to look <laughs> afterward? What have you done? Yeah. So that, that is the key of the presentation and the CAD design. Uh, show us what, uh, that you did all your engineering to tell me that you're building what, uh, what is on the paper. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what, what is your total budget? And uh, our total would be 75,000. Uh, so and the IMA key one without the 20p? Uh, without the 20p, no, sorry. The Without the 20p should be 25, uh, 75, um, with, sorry, yes. This is a bit odd. Uh, okay, so. We have the actual bum in, in the table. It should be around 73. It should have been here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you. Um, I only have one question, and I think uh, I, know I didn't get that from your presentation. Does it work? Uh, yeah. yeah, we have done testing. Uh, yeah. uh, we haven't fully tested the, uh, how reliable the vehicle is on um, uh, over the actual uh, testing for today, but we have uh, conducted multiple tests on like uh, variations with distances and uh, uh, how... Um, We've done it on different surfaces as well, just to see uh, if the LDRs really make that massive of a difference um, and if it can still manage to detect the uh, bullseye. Um, so we've given it a bit of, of leeway and um, uh, implemented through the code uh, just to make sure that once the, the black line is detected, it, it should stop. Yeah, I think it would have been really good for you to include that in your presentation. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You were asked about um, the stepper motor and the slip. So my question is going to add on that. Your device has two wheel drive. And if there is any slippage of one of the wheels, that means your device will turn slightly on one side. Even if the steppers are counting accurately and they maintain the same number of rotations left and right, if you have a, if there is any, um, imperfection, which life is full of them, on one of the wheels or contact, that means you will steer away from your straight line. How, you, how did you consider to mitigate this misalignment? Um, well, to con do you want to answer? Okay. Um, the differential design, um, obviously it, it completely eliminates the, the uh, requirement of having to move in a straight line uh, because the vehicle can just turn and reposition on the actual target. Um, Obviously, if you're using a, a four-wheel design, you can't really re realign when you approach the target. Uh, you'd have to do some weird back up and back forwards to align the actual target. But when you're using a differential drive, the, the wheels can rotate uh, uh, counter on each side to uh, reposition to uh, position the, the data point directly on the target. And uh, we also used, it's not explained here, but we also used um, a triangulation process so that the, the datum point is always positioned correctly uh, in uh, proportion with the, the two sensors that we're using. So uh, as long as the proportion of the, the vehicle uh, with the, the shashi, sashi, sashi is all correct, <laughs> um, it should be uh, accurate every single time. There, there's no uh, realignment issues. But your solution only works if your vehicle never steers away from the per perimeter of the target. So as long as you have any a bit of coverage on the target, it yeah. can correct itself. But if there is any through, chance, through, through testing, we never, yeah, uh, we never uh, encountered these on. issues. You never got too much on the side. Yeah, I understand. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Kingston. Well done, and. Um, Thank you for all the teams to present and well done for answering the very hard questions. Yeah. Okay, so that's the end of uh, the presentations for today. We will move on now for, with the design review. So, can I have here team UCLD for the design review, please?
space for my hand. Let's try now. There we go. So, uh, right. So I'm just showing on on uh, on the screen your CAD, uh, and this is the device that, that you can see is fairly accurate. Uh, a couple of things that you didn't fix the batteries. You did roughly half of the wiring. So I hope that that helped you in um, in, in doing some bits and bobs. Things that I've seen um, in in reality is that. Uh, you could clearly see here all your devices, and you didn't uh, thought about protecting all the electrical devices and all the other stuff. Um, so the CAD is fairly accurate. Wiring was not there. Did you find any challenge, any interesting event? Mm -hmm. uh, as you can see, the wiring is a bit complicated. So I think we just, uh, we just did the, um, the functional ones, the ones that actually made a big difference. We, for, the, for the wires, we modeled um, all the wires that actually uh, drive the device, we didn't model the wires of any sensors, uh, purely because we, we we didn't want it to um, just be com a complete mess. We wanted it to um, represent our device a bit. So we only modeled um, the wires that would actually drive the device forward and backwards as well. Yeah, but as a result, uh, the, the, the actual product, which is what we're going to use, is a little bit, not a complete mess, but is a little bit on the, on the challenging side. So um, things that, that uh, I, I understand that modeling the wire could be time consuming and, and complex, but things, if you, if you look around, uh, you may have wired rela re wires relatively close to your gears. So that could be a, a functional issue. You had laser uh, cut parts and you had a 3D printed part where you could have included some wire management eyelets, uh, um, pre-holes for clipping uh, or all the other stuff that may have not costed anything. So uh, one of the things that we, we saw yesterday, there was a team that drilled a lot of holes in the laser cut activity and just passed the wire through. So they didn't add any, uh, any cost for component to manage the wires and they actually reduced the price, the cost of the board because the board had a, a, lower, a lower area. Uh, yeah, we did try to mitigate that by taping it to the bottom of the spoiler. Yeah, we did have the issues of the wires uh, touching the gears, but we had tried to stick it at the bottom. Yeah. Uh, is the battery, so the battery is moving? Yeah, no, we can't. Can oh, you will strap it down. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, apart from that one, what was the most difficult thing? So if I, if I look at this, you have been fairly accurate. So there are all the, all the characteristics that, that you needed are here. So you have your bearings, uh, uh, you have everything there. So you really went, uh, uh, you really did a good job considering the time frame and the purpose of the thing. Um, what was the, the most difficult bit uh, that you found? It was changing it after every iteration. So we had one initial design and then once we tested it and we wanted to change something, we would then um, have to go back to the CAD and then change that. So that was the most difficult part because we just had to keep changing the CAD back and forth. You learn how to have effective yeah. te uh, CAD technique when you, if and when you, you go better. But yes, that happens as well in real life. Don't worry. Um, what did make it easier is we, we tried to add codes to almost every single part, which you can see along the side. Um, this just helped us, you know, when you say an effective CAD technique, um, we didn't have to continuously go back and find that part and then put it back in. It was just always using these single parts and then just rearranging them because um, the, the device arrangement changed. So it was just moving around bits and pieces and keeping the same parts essentially. Okay, now given that you're all here, let's put it on the scale and see how, what is the weight of the device that will, that will run.
question from anybody else? Okay, the next one, UCLC. If you open Fusion again, sorry for the delay. Yeah, is that? Where did it go wrong? <laughs> no, not that. I mean, it's open up. So, yeah, uh, in the middle one. So, <laughs> good, let's have a look. It looks like your CAD is very, very accurate. Um, I don't know if you want to stay, if you want to, thank you, uh, if you want to stay in the center so that other people could, could see. The, the difference between the CAD and, uh, and the product is almost negligible. There is a little bit of wire management. Uh, uh, but apart from that one, uh, I cannot really see uh, big differences. I see that, that both in the real product and in CAD, you try to keep all the heavy components uh, in the center. Uh, was, was it coming from the day zero? Was learning from previous um, design? What, why you, you choose this a good idea? Um, we wanted to keep the weight distribution fairly center. But one decision we made was we tried keeping the pulley in the middle, which would offset the motor. Ah. But then right now we have the motor in the middle and the pulley to the side. We thought that if we have the pulley in the middle and it's off to the side, it might angle the shaft a little bit. But that wasn't the case for us, so that's why we ended up with this design, where all the heavy components are located in the, the middle line. Very interesting that you decided to have a, almost a switch bumper at the front with the 3D printed stuff. Um, in, in our company, we have a 3D printer with the capability of making flexible parts. Mm -hmm. So um, not uh, with rubber, so with the, with the plastic. Uh, thinking about a spring in 3D printing is a, is a, good, is a good thought. So you so really explore uh, the technique. In terms of execution, how many trials, how many attempts we did with that design before breaking it or making it work or whatever? Oh, is it turning those springs? Yeah. Yeah, um, so the reason why we went for 3D printed springs in the first place was because we can prototype so quickly. This print is about five to ten minutes so we did about um three iterations oh. so that's just five fifteen minutes of our time and we don't have to buy extra springs or like normal helical strings oh that's good so you did only three iteration to get to the spring that you wanted that's 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 remarkable um everything looks very very you know in line and accurate and you did a good job um thank you shall we go on the scale and see how it looks like just a disclaimer though we since our water jet cutter broke down. We couldn't put steel wheels in the bomb. Um, it's for steel wheels. Do you know the weight? Yeah, for the steel wheels, it's around 2,500. But because uh, we don't have the steel wheels, 17. Unfortunately, we judge what we Yeah, it's just a comment, so you, you know. Yeah, we understand. Thank you. 
Now, can we please have um, Kingston A advanced? So there is way. And we layered it. Um, we layered it um, because we had an included breadboard that I didn't include in the CAD, but um, I shifted everything up a little bit, slid the battery underneath. So the, the, the thing that I see here is that there is a different content of the device compared to what you put in CAD. Yep. How do we know is that you're still in, in target for the cost or not? Because clearly you have put more stuff. Well, no, in the BOM I have included the... Uh, that, that's I've interesting. So why you did CAD the then? Um, the CAD was, is not helping you to align with the bomb. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Um, the build, so it was, more, I guess, more of an artistic uh, representation. Of, yeah. Well, yeah, we are we are here to score your artistic yeah. representation from yeah. an engineering perspective. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So shall yeah. we use uh, like a yeah. like a colorful hat and no, the, the no, oil no, paint no. out? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but um, yeah, the, the the rest is is you have the IRs at the bottom, the ultrasonic, and the steppers. Well, we've also catted the wheels. Um, because these originally were made for servos, uh, continuous servos, um, but we swapped them out for steppers, and when we made that decision, um, we 3D printed the wheels, the same dimension as the servo wheels, in order to slip on the, um, the silicone. Okay, could you please flip it underneath so that we have a look? Um, so you excessively use the 3D printing, which is great, and there are a lot of, yeah. uh, uh, there are a lot of um, windows over there, um, yeah. You clearly didn't thought about cable management, and your device look a little bit uh, <laughs> uh, crazy. Uh, well, it's not it's not crazy. If you think about the robustness with the wires uh, that deliver a, a function, so yeah. the stuff that you have there is for a job. Yeah. Um, if you don't think about them, they could dang around and uh, get tangled and uh, potentially yeah. stop you uh, from prevent you from delivering yeah. the mission. Yeah. So one of the advantages that you have in using CAD is that you could think about all the stuff and think about what things could mm. go wrong. Um, so yeah, um, shall we go on the scale? Sure. Is there any other question? No, I think that we're okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Well done again for answering the questions and presenting your card here. Not an easy task. Uh, let's just move on with our schedule today. Sorry, just coming back here. So I would just would like to call Bridget Oguez. She's, she brought to, to us this uh, amazing addition to the design challenge this year, which is a great opportunity for the students to put their engineering skills as well uh, into practice. So Bridget, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name's Bridget. I am part of the academic program ANSYS. We've been involved with the design challenge for a couple of years here. Davide, when I first showed up, I fell in love with just the practicality of the challenge. I'm a civil engineer. I have a degree in civil engineering. I did a bit of 
concrete making while I did, you know, but nothing else really practical. And I came out of uni university terrified of going into work because I didn't think I could actually do anything. So I really appreciate the level of practicality and the challenges that you go through here because that, that makes you ready to face work or even start your own company or build your own house. Whatever you want to do, you get those kind of skills in these kind of events. And the fact that you're starting some of them, like even the first year, fantastic. Love, love the whole concept. Okay, so um, today I have a few slides and I'll just quickly announce who did the best in the design and the simulation challenge. But my talk is going to talk, going to address academics, the teachers, and also the students. So the slides, just, you'll know who I'm talking to when you go through the slides, you know who it is. So the ANSYS academic program, we have a mission. We do simulation, if you don't know what ANSYS does. Um, structure analysis, fluid analysis, electromagnetics, optics, name it, we probably do it. Um, companies use us a lot, um, so we want to work with universities, with students, so that students have this skill. We call it a superpower, we would. We call it a superpower, I want them to have the superpower to go into industry and, you know, just be amazing and solve problems in the most efficient way possible. Um, and one of the things we do, of course, is work with student competitions like this. To help with that, so this is the academic part, so we understand that adding things into the curriculum, even adding things into a competition like design challenge, adding ele elements, is a challenging thing to do. So we, we, have a, we have a partnership plan. If you're interested in adding simulation into the curriculum, but there's some challenges, we have a fund that can help. Talk to me about that, I, I manage that as well. So we want to help you to do this well and to help your students succeed. So currently, we've done that for like a, a year and a half now. We've worked with different countries all over the world, universities all over the world to integrate simulation, to update their courses, and we're gonna continue doing this. We've just finished a round of applications. We have another one going on. So every year, we're spending about 250,000 pounds on this. So please get involved, we'd love to work with you. Okay, and also for the students, Careers begin with using ANSYS. So I will highlight one particular person here, Christina, right at the end. She was in a student team, a student car, one of those car teams, came an intern at ANSYS. She, had, she was kind of sneaky. She wanted to join an F1 team, and she thought it was hard to join the F1 team directly. So she thought, I'm going to be a CFD engineer, first of all, at ANSYS. It worked. Two years later, after working for ANSYS, Red Bull poached her. She's got her dream job now. So careers do they really do help understand the skill of simulation. We're not just saying it. But aside from that, this chart says, in summary, that a significant part of design is spent figuring out what's going to work, not going to work. About 70-something percent is just figuring out what will not work. That wastes time, it wastes resources, effort, frustration. But if you're using simulation, you can exponentially reduce that. That's the whole idea. Designing out the failure modes in, in, on the computer before you build the first thing. And that's the whole idea in a nutshell. And as we're moving towards a more sustainable environment, using our resources more efficiently, this is a thing that's becoming more and more important. And it does mean adding an extra layer into what you do, but then you're, you're just being more efficient in what you do. So that was what challenged me to add this simulation layer into the competition. It's an add-on, it's not compulsory, but if you're doing it, it can make you more efficient. So this was the idea. You could do a structure analysis, a thermal analysis, a fluid analysis, and I had a little video, if you've seen this online, of what was possible to be done in this simulation challenge. And it should run, hopefully, in a few minutes. I got a colleague of mine to do this for me, just to show the idea. And the beauty of the thing is that with answers, of course, you can do any of these things. We've got tools to support you with all of that. Not only that, you can get the software um, for free if you get a partnership with us. I feel like I'm marketing myself now. <laughs> no, but just the, the superpower and the ability to design more efficiently is what I'm really talking about here. Okay, cool. So, thank you to the two teams that did submit on time for this. It's the first year we're doing it, so this is great. And I think my job here is just be to announce who, who did the best in it. Now, what split the two teams, I will simply say, was just one thing. So you scored the same on setting up your boundary conditions and things like that. But what split was that one team optimized their design after doing the simulation. And they clearly demonstrated what they had changed and the impact that had made, which is the whole idea of doing the simulation. And I think they're smiling, or the, one, the team that knows they did or they're smiling. So just congratulations to UCL Team C.
If you want to know a breakdown, I'm happy to have a chat with you afterwards about it. So that means that you get to go to the finals of this competition where you get to have a blog with ANSYS. You get a certification. It's like the certification costs about 300 pounds, but we will provide that for free for all the students who will take it. That goes onto your CV. You take it into your career that you are certified to use ANSYS. And um, that's me. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, you <laughs> can. Thank you very much, Bridget. That was brilliant. Uh, well done on UCLC again. Okay, so that's the end of our first part of this competition. We can have a break now. Uh, lunch is going to be served soon. And I would say for the students, use this time as well to network with the other teams, with the academics, uh, with our judges as well, and do the final touches of your devices to get ready uh, for the challenge in the afternoon. Thank you very much today, and I'll be back to you soon.
Join us at London South Bank University for the making of you. Wibbling, wobbling all over the place. Okay. That's it.
once you touch the wall, it reverses the, the switch. And we're trying to come back as close as possible to the... Oh, see, I'll do it again. Try to come back as close as possible to the... Uh, it's all been pre-programmed to do that. It's all programmed, but we can't do it. So how does it know when to stop? using this one, oh, yeah, we are just doing three. And today is different because they can use the programmable devices, yeah, like a twin. Okay. And they were going to have two targets. So they will start on this target, touch the wall, and then come back on the try to come back as close as possible to the target. So is the competition over? Oh. No, the devices will start after Hi everyone, uh, I'm Abdul and I'm here at the iMeki Design Challenge 2024 in the Advanced Division. So yesterday this, this, that was the, um, the initial design challenge, um, this is the Advanced one, so we're on day number two. I'm here with Philly from the Kingston team. So Philly, how are you doing? I'm doing alright, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Um, so just a few questions. Essentially, after the judges, is, you know, the uh, constructive criticism you received, how do you feel going forward with this? Um, well, I feel that there is a lot of room for future implementation and future uh, work that could be done onto the repeatable vehicle. Um, it's really quite interesting to see uh, UCL's perspectives and all the other universities that are here uh, and all, you know, talking to the individual students and seeing what they, uh, you know, what kind of sensors they've chosen and uh, so on and so forth. It's really, really interesting and I think, you know, we could take it uh, back to Kingston uh, remodel and maybe rework our design and maybe um, the next student after me might do better um, and I think it's it's really uh, it's quite an optimistic outlook for, for next year. Yeah. Excellent and um, now that you're here and we've had the presentations and we've um, we've sort of gone through the, essentially the less of the action we're just about to go into the action of the races how do you feel what, what's the atmosphere like for you? Uh, well, the atmosphere is, it, for me at least, is, is quite tense because you don't know if it's going to work until you actually get up to that bullseye, hit the start button, and hopefully everything runs smoothly. I mean, this is why, as engineers, we do tests and uh, we do multiple iterations of our designs, making sure that our sensors work well with the code uh, and the electronics and, and everything that goes into it. You have to make sure that that communication between the uh, technical side of things are, are consistent. And y again, if you look at the other universities, um, yeah, it's, it, it, they work, but you, you know, that's why we put in so much effort. It's to make sure that that one run that counts works as well, so. Excellent, excellent. Now, my next question would essentially just be, you, you've worked on this for months, I believe, is that correct? Yeah, months, yeah, since uh, October. Excellent, incredible. So. That, that whole journey, how has that been for you personally? What kind of like development have you seen? Well, uh, as a fourth year MN student, um, it's been quite hectic to keep up with, um, you know, the iMeki design challenge, obviously, because you have other uh, priorities and other preoccupations before. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's learning something completely new. Right, because this is engineering at, at its finest. You do iterations, you t you do testing, you um, yeah, you just want 
every single part of your device to work, even if you don't know that much about electronics or if you don't know that much about coding, you have to find the time to get into it and really figure it out, which is, is quite fun, but the development, yeah. We got to where we are and it's, it's a working prototype. Could definitely be better, but I'm, I'm happy with where it's at and I think it's my efforts that have paid off. Um, yeah. Excellent, excellent. And have you ever been to an iMakey event before? Uh, no, this is my first time being in a, uh, at an iMakey event and I kind of like it. It's really, really nice to be here. And um, just on a last question, what advice would you give to someone who perhaps would be thinking about doing this next year? Um, well, value your time and, and split it off wisely. Um, know when you're going to uh, you know, commit to this project um, because there, there, there can be last minute alterations where you, know, you want to change a sensor or you want to change your motors or you want to change whatever it could be. Um, make sure that, that you, know, you start early on and you really get into the research of it because there's, there's quite a lot of resources that have covered um, competitions like this before. And you know, obviously UCL, and, and they upload their their um, like a bunch of videos of their prototypes and this and that. And it's it's really good to look at because you get a whole bunch of different perspectives that are quite interesting. Excellent. It's been a pleasure interviewing you, and no um, it's been a good luck with the races. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. And that's all, folks. Um, so we will have a few more extra interviews as we go around today. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And for now, just signing off. Thank you.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, as promised, our second interview of the day, I'm here with Rashad as part, and he's part of the UCL Team D. Um, Rashad, how are you doing today? Yeah, uh, it's been good. Uh, the competition's been a bit crazy so far. Um, we're still uh, waiting for the actual main competition to start. And yeah, it's been fun. It's been crazy looking at other teams as well. And yeah, it's been, it's, we've enjoyed it so far. And so far, what's been the, let's say, the most exciting part of the competition? Of course, the races have not yet been done. And we all know that that's usually where the suspense is really, you know, yeah. at, basically. But so far, you've, you've presented. How did that go, in fact? Yeah, I think the the presentation went good. Um, we were all very well spoken. Um, I think we we kind of knew what to expect because we had we have the experience from being at the design challenge from last year. Um, so I think we we answered the judges' questions quite well, and yeah, I think it was very good for us. Yeah, excellent. Um, and in terms of the design process, how has that been for you? Because I, I I could see that you were very well organised. So how was that from start to end? Just give us an idea of what that was like. Yeah, there, there was a lot of um, project management from, from our side. Um, we, there was communication between all our team members. We distributed all the work, um, whether that was the bomb, the CAD. Um, we, we kept in touch and we always updated everything together, which was very important. And that's what uh, made this project a success for us. Um, we, we always tried to keep everything updated together. And yeah, we're, we're, we're very proud of ourselves and what we've given to this competition. So. We'll see later on how it goes. Excellent. And now that you're here and you've observed the competition, how do you feel going into the races? Um, look, I mean, you've got, to get, you've got to give credit where credit is due. Um, there's a lot of talented teams that are here and we're very happy to compete with them. Um, you know, we know that it's going to be tough. Um, like I said, we're very proud of ourselves and, and what we've done. And we wish everyone the best of luck and yeah, we'll see how it goes. Excellent. And... As a final question, so you've done this for for two years essentially. Um, what exactly have you learned in those two years, and what could you, what piece of advice would you say would be the most key piece of advice for someone wanting to do this um, for next year, or just well, for in general for next year? Oh, in general, yeah. I mean, these extracurricular projects are always such a, a good way to learn more about the practical side of engineering. Um, there's only theory can only get you so far, and just by, you know, we failed so much with this device, um, but just going through that iteration process and um, understanding the engineering processes behind everything, and it, it, it is, it's a very good learning experience for someone that wants to understand engineering design, and yeah, we, we've really enjoyed it, and for anyone that wants to do it, I would say go for it. It's, it's a very good opportunity to compete. In Excellent, and so we've seen here, um, I believe for the one of the first times ever, there was an there was an ANSYS challenge, um, and your team as well as the other UCL team also participated. Um, just a question on that: what kind of what kind of development? What was the development like of developing the skills, being able to use that software, or has it always just come naturally for you? Um, I, I don't think anything in, in engineering is going to come naturally. I think it, it takes a lot of a lot of um, iterating and. Um, with ANSYS, um, it is something that we do have experience with, with our university. So we took on that challenge um, of modeling our gear deformation. And yeah, I think um, it was a good learning experience for us. Um, uh, we actually managed to prove why we wanted to use the gear ratio that we chose using ANSYS. And you know, credit to the other team, they, they've smashed it by winning it. Um, they're, they're, everything was unbelievable from their side. So. Excellent. So a key part to take away from this was that, in general, this was a, an excellent learning experience for everyone involved. Um, I guess that brings me on to my last question. I would, I would have to say, after seeing your project and seeing everyone else's project, you know, do you think there's anything you could have done differently? Um, yeah, I think if we had just that extra bit of time, um, we would have maybe been able to iterate a bit more, maybe uh, actually look into slowing down our vehicle before impact. Uh, we did have quite a few issues with that. Um, but yeah, um, in terms of what we would do differently, I think the judges mentioned it as well during our presentation. Um, we did get very close to the 80 pound mark. Um, maybe just finding alternative ways to bring that price down. Uh, I think maybe changing our chassis design um, to again, bring the price down. Um, yeah, there, there, there's so many things that if we had a little bit of extra time, we, we, we would have tried to implement, yeah. 
Excellent. Thank you so much for being interviewed. Right. Uh, it was a pleasure. And we'll see you soon, folks, as after lunch, I believe there should be some, some peer review slash scrutineering by the judges. Um, so stay tuned for that, folks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'm here with Simon Philbit, Interim Dean for the School of Engineering. How are you doing, Simon? Very well, thank you, Abdul. Uh, hello, everyone. Delighted to be here today. Thank you. So um, just a few questions. So how does it feel being the university that is hosting the event this year? Well, I think it's very good. And uh, the School of Engineering, um, design is a, a key part of, of engineering within the mechanical engineering and design. And I think it's excellent for LSBU um, to be hosting this event and also to be partnering with the Institution of, of Mechanical Engineers, which is a prestigious um, professional society for engineers. Thank you very much. Um, so another question. So you've, you've seen the level of competition here. You've seen the ingenuity that students have have shown on their d on display. Uh, how, how do you, how does that make you feel? You know, seeing all of this uh, in, in young and up and coming engineers. I think it's really impressive to see. And what's uh, one thing that I noticed was um, not only the technical quality that, that's coming through, and and of course, you know, young engineers being trained in the technical uh, dimensions of, of mechanical engineering and design. That's great to see. But you could also see how the, the you know the students are working together as a, as a team, and they're approaching it as a, a project, and how they're allocating uh, the different tasks. And, and so that kind of emphasizes, you know, not just the technical dimension of being an engineer, but the professional skills, which are all important in terms of, you know, securing a job and, and graduate employment. And increasingly, you know, often we'll hear from industry and companies that they want young engineers and graduates to have that technical foundation, but they also want to see those professional skills. And I think participating for the students in this kind of competition is a great way for them to build you know, their, their professional skills in terms of communication, working within a project, um, decision making, finding solutions to problems. And um, so I think a competition like this is, is really good for that. Excellent. And this one's going to be a bit controversial, but you've seen the level of competition here. You can see how fierce it really is. If it comes down to it, you know, in your opinion, who do you think has you know a really good edge, essentially based upon design alone? I, I think I, I may well stay um, neutral on this, to be honest, because um, I, I was actually impressed by the enthusiasm by, by all the teams that presented. And they each came up with their own solution. They spoke about them uh, with detail. Um, but nevertheless, you know, the, the, the solutions did have different merits and, and different functionalities. And I, I wish them you know, well to all the teams. So um, yeah, I, I, yeah, maybe prefer to stay neutral at this point. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you very much for being interviewed, Simon. And um, for all of, the, all of you watching at home, the races should begin around the one o'clock to two o'clock mark. Um, Stay tuned for that, because it should be really exciting, as yesterday some of you may have followed. Um, really, the suspense was, was leaving a lot of people speechless, essentially. So stay tuned for that, folks. Thank you very much.
when I finished the degree, I wanted to become either a chartered engineer within the Institute of Civil Engineer Industry or possibly go into project management. We have the Strength and Materials Lab where we test concrete and steel. So for example, the steel structures we can see, like with the molar structure design, we can see how stable they can be and how much pressure they can take. So in, being in the lab helps us to analyse that. LSB has supported me by offering one-to-one -one sessions with personal tutors as well as the academics are arranging site visits, which can help us not only network by providing possible future internships.
Yeah, it's, not, it's not the same. So it's, it's not the same either. Yeah. Yeah. We have a list for rich. The, the value is a bit more. Second same. one. Second one is decided for two point four meter. So we leave it uh, two point four. I don't know.
Hello everyone, so I'm joined with Gabe and Owen. Uh, these are our LSBU students who participated last year in an iMeki Design Challenge. Uh, thank you for, for being with us here today. Um, just a few questions. So, having participated last year and coming in the top three, a big achievement. Congratulations for that, by the way. Um, how does it feel being here and you know seeing the, the level of competition here as well? Um, yeah, well, it's really exciting to see. Last year, it was definitely quite a tense competition. It was quite nerve-wracking going to the event. It was at Kingston University. And um, we defi I think we definitely felt like one of the smaller teams there. Lots of unis went with a few different, like A, B and C teams. But I think we um, held our own. Our model got picked. It was like top three for design review. So it was really good to have it um, critiqued by some well-respected engineers so we know what we can do next time. If you um, maybe, do you want to say about the design manufacturer? Yeah, I think in the future it would have been good to have some replacement parts or maybe not rely on so many bespoke parts and be able to maybe laser cut or have 2D manufacturing as a bigger part of the design process. Um, but really it was more about testing, testing and more testing after we had a physical design. I think that would have been the best improvement that we could have done. Excellent. And um, in terms of having this event hosted at LSBU today, how does that make you feel as an LSBU student? Um, yeah, proud. It's, it's good to have you know, such an involved event here at our university. Um, you know, maybe one day we can recompete and learn from our mistakes last time. Definitely need to test rather than rely on what the theory says. Excellent. And... Um, just some, some thoughts on your on the ingenuity you're seeing here today. Yeah. How do you how do you feel knowing that this is uh, this seeing that the, the level of, of ingenuity here, the, the innovation, the fact that everyone's so sort of like every you, you can feel that spirit of competition here. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting. Exciting to think that um, this is well within our, our realms of what we can achieve. It looks quite daunt you know, it looks a bit daunting at the minute because they're quite complicated designs, but it's definitely, definitely possible to achieve with enough um, hard work, trial and error. Um, so yeah, it's exciting. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I suppose that's all from me here. Uh, thank you so much for, for being interviewed by, by me. Thank and, you. Um, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Yeah.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We just got back from lunch now. The judges has just, they have just finished doing the markings on the lanes. Can everyone proceed to the lane area, please? We are about to start.
I have UCLD. Was another Oh, okay. Check for the, the window. Uh, no, 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 no. You, I'm going to explain how we're going to run, yeah? Yeah, the only issue with our design is. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the race. Um, in lanes, in, la in all lanes, you have uh, for short for the short range race, you have UCL team D. The long range is UCL team C, and for the medium range, you have Kingston University. As they've now just placed their their devices on the starting block, they can no longer touch them once just to turn on the switches essentially. And the races have just begun with UCLC showing a good start. Now, as we've seen in previous events, the, um, the long distance race, any errors in the long distance race become more prominent because the distance is larger, therefore the error is more obvious. So UCL Team D has just finished there. UCL's Team C now returning back to the starting position and Kingston University's team seems to be the slowest, but 
it's not always the speed that counts. Seems to be doing very well. And that is the end of the race for UCL Team C. Just... Oh, no. Kingston University seems to have continues to be experiencing some technical failure. We'll just have to see how that goes. It hasn't come back, it's just hit the wall. We're just waiting to see what happens now. Thirty seconds remaining. Unfortunately, Kingston University cannot touch their device at this time. So we'll just have to wait and see what the final result is. And that is the end of the uh, of this section of the race. Uh, it'll have to be a reset for Kingston University. Um, and both, so essentially, what's going to happen now is that there'll be a rotation of different ranges. So we're just seeing the setup for that now. So we're just swapping lanes now. As we can see, it's going to be Kingston University in the short range and UCL Team D in long range, and UCL Team C in medium range. The second run for these two, for these three teams, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Okay, folks, we're just doing some final checks now just before the race has started. Just some small minor adjustments just to make sure that once the, the devices do come back, they are within, they're in line with the bullseye. Two minutes left to reset. One minute remaining just before the start of this race. And the race has just begun. UCL Team D showing good speed coming out the start. Kingston University again slow and steady. 
the UCL Team C has just made, has made contact with the board. Now returning back to the original position. And Kingston University has had its chance at redemption, successfully having made contact with the wall and returning back to the to original position. This is a great. This is great for Kingston University. An excellent opportunity to show us that they can they can really pull through. And UCL Team C has shown that they, they have landed on, on the bullseye. Just have to wait and see the scoring. And Kingston University in the short range. Just going back to that bullseye. So let's just hope that they can land just on the mark. And they've landed on the bullseye, which is a... Uh, which is a very good, a very good run. Excellent, a very good turnaround for Kingston University. UCL Team C showing very good success in the medium range race. As the races are continuing, you can you can really hear that the suspense in the room is getting a lot more. There's a lot more excitement in the air. So this should be the last rotation for for our teams rotating. If they haven't done one of the lengths of race, this will be their last chance to do that. Kingston University in the long range and UCL Team C in the short range leaving UCL Team D in the medium range. So they should be able to do the same as they've done before, starting off at the original bullseye, making contact with the wall. Hopefully when they pass over the sensor in the beginning, it should detect, the bullseye, sorry, in the beginning, the sensor should detect where that, where that landing zone should be, come back and then land ideally as close as possible to that center mark. So we're just getting ready to start that race. As you can see, again, the final adjustments being made, just making sure that the points all line up. UCL Team C just ensuring they've got that precision. Getting ready to start. And the team's ready to start. As we can see, all teams hot off the blocks and UCL Team C has made contact with the wall that should be returning back to its original position just before going back to that bullseye mark and UCL Team D successful in that as well we have seen that Kingston University has been going quite slow in all the races but so it's always a speed it's always about the precision in these sorts of races Okay, so UCL Team C finishing their, their run. UCL Team D just shy of the, of the bullseye mark, but nevertheless an excellent attempt. The excitement is really building up in the air. As you can hear, the voices are getting a lot more louder as the teams come to the end of this round of races. So there will be a team alternation, so different teams should be racing soon. And Kingston University, hopefully their, their device should be able to make those, those minor adjustments. A 
successfully made contact with the wall, now returning back to the original position. In two minutes, come on. I believe it is they have two minutes to complete a run from one end to the other and back. And it seems as though the device has recognized the colors, not returned back to the original position, but rather gone straight onto the bullseye. We'll have to wait to see what the judges think about this. There may have been some coding issues with that, but nevertheless, the robot seems to have done something unexpected and still landed on the bullseye. Really unexpected stuff here. You could never expect anything when watching these races, so we'll just have to see how that goes. Nevertheless, a successful run for our teams UCL, C, D, and Kingston University. Okay, so we've got the University of Hertfordshire, both their teams A and B, just getting ready now to start at the starting block. And we've just seen the success that UCL teams C have had in their runs. So let's just hope that that form of success can be displayed across all the designs. However, nevertheless, all teams have brought that team spirit as well as that racing competition to this race. So we're just getting ready now to start off. I was told this before as well. So one of the Hertfordshire teams may have had to make some last minute calibrations to their design due to the fact that I believe they calibrated it for an A4 piece of paper. So that should be something interesting. We hope that those calibrations have, are going to make a huge difference in this portion of the race. Nevertheless, suspense at an all-time high as usual. Okay, folks, so I've just heard this fresh. One of the Hertfordshire teams seems to be experiencing some technical difficulties, but both teams are approaching the starting block, so this should be a very interesting race. We'll just have to see how it goes as soon as the race begins. So stay tuned, because it should be getting a lot more suspenseful as we speak. Just to remind you all, both teams have two minutes to set up, so we should see how that goes. OK, 
Okay, both teams having their devices on the starting block. We'll just have to wait to see how it goes. Some minor adjustments being made. Just some minor adjustments being made. I believe I can see a laser inside on the screen from the Hertfordshire Team A. Just a device, just to get that those fine movements made, making sure they've got that accuracy. Really an excellent level of ingenuity we're seeing from all teams this year. Two minutes left to set up. Just some last minute minor adjustments. There is a lot of activity I cannot show behind the scenes. However, I can assure you there is a lot of suspense as well as anticipation for a successful start for both the University of Hertfordshire teams. Remember folks, these are very complicated, very high intensity, last minute adjustments. So it's all, it's, they, they remember these teams have been working on these projects for months now. And with one minute left, it all comes down to this. For at least this section of races, they will be allowed to re recoup slash recalibrate for the next section, whether that be the, between the, the long distance change or the medium distance change. So it's not over yet. Okay, so we're seeing, we're seeing the device for UCL Team B being put on the bullseye mark. Sorry, the University of Hertfordshire, correction on my part, apologies. We're just seeing those last minute precision makes and moves being made. And both teams seem to be ready. We're just getting ready to start. A successful start from UCL team, sorry, the University of Hertfordshire, Team A. And unfortunately, we, we, I, think, I believe the University of Hertfordshire's Team B struggling to get off the block. And that's Hertfordshire back on the original mark. Going forward, back to the bullseye. They're a lot slower now. I believe for this, probably, well, hang on a second, folks. Both teams seem to have stalled, but we'll just have to wait and see what happens. This could be due to a number of a variety of different reasons, but we'll just have to wait and see. And it seems that the judges have called it. Unfortunately, both Hertfordshire teams were having struggles with this race, but they will be allowed to recalibrate for the next round of races. Both teams switching lanes. And that's Hertfordshire, Team A, in the short distance. Hertfordshire, Team B, in the long distance. Now remember, folks, with the long distance, it always seems to be that any errors 
are exacerbated a lot more. So we'll just have to wait and see how Team B fares in this run. And remember, folks, they all have, they always have the two minutes to just get ready to get their, their devices on the starting block. Okay, folks, so we're just, we're just watching the setup for both of the Hertfordshire teams. Hertfordshire Team A on the short range and long range, Hertfordshire Team B. And there you go, Team A just calibrating, making sure that their device is exactly in line with that bullseye mark. Now with both teams unfortunately having, you know, struggled with the first round, we'll just have to hope that there's a chance for redemption in this round. You've got two minutes left. I believe that's one minute left for any fine adjustments. And I believe some some difficulties being seen with Team B. Well, it could just be a reset, but we'll have to wait and see how that goes. And that's, it appears that they opened up, you know, a portion of their design just to, just to ensure that all the wires and all the fixtures are all set properly. got to say folks the suspense is really it's really killing me at this point a chance at redemption we'll just have to see how it goes just to remind you all this has been months in the making for these teams so there is a lot not coming down on these races so we'll just have to wait and see Hertfordshire, Team A adjusting once again. They seem to be ready. Team B still making those final, final adjustments. Let's just hope to see what happens. Just final adjustments. Ten seconds remaining. And they've closed the compartments. Just setting up now. And the races have to start. We'll just have to wait and see. Okay, both races starting. Team A, hot off the blocks, just scanning to make sure that their sensors have picked up the colors. They've gone back to the original block, but it seems that Team B hasn't left the starting block yet. And Team A now approaching very slowly to ensure that the device hits the bullseye. And it appears they've stopped just shy of the mark. We'll just have to wait and see. Unfortunately, with Team B, 
there hasn't been any movement from the original position. So this could be due to a number of reasons. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. Spirit of competition. It's really difficult. So now, unfortunately, the teams will be allowed to recalibrate and recoup for the next session of races. So their final chance at a successful run from start to finish. Remember, again, this has been months in the making, so there's a lot at stake here for both teams. Final chance. Just seeing some rotation of devices being made. So after this, it should be the judges' liberation on who the winning teams are, followed by the grand final. Hertfordshire, team A and B, just setting up now for that final run. Starting in three minutes. Team B just doing some initial, I believe, calibrations. Just a quick test run to ensure their device is functioning. And then now a reset. I've just seen, I've just heard now, there was a, a practice run being done with Team B. Unfortunately, that is not allowed, but just some conflict. Which we'll just have a look to see what happens now. Team should be fine, but both teams on the starting block. It seems to have just been a regular, just a mistake. Both teams getting ready to set up. They do have two minutes to set up. So we'll just have to wait and see what the result of that is. As you can see, the crowds are all lined up, excited to see what the result of this race will be. Both teams ready. Both teams starting. Team A hot off the blocks. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. Team B, unfortunately not, not just yet. Team A successfully scanning. And now returning back to their original position. So their device should have now detected how far away the bullseye is by the time it gets back to the original bullseye mark. And it seems some technical issue, unfortunately, Team A's robot has come off the track, and now it's just battling to get back on the track. It might not be enough torque in those in those motors to be able to to really push them back onto the track, so we'll just have to wait and see. And Team B still in the original starting position. It may have been an unsuccessful starting run for this team, but nevertheless, we've seen a lot of heart in this competition, and that's really what's mattered here. Unfortunately, just have to wait and see. And that seems to be all. Uh, unfortunately, both Team A and Team B and another unsuccessful run. So now we'll just have to wait for the judges' deliberation. Just some advice being given to our teams, you know, just making, just, you know, calculating to see what went wrong, reviewing, just making sure that. They're aware that they showed a lot of heart and a lot of uh, effort in this in this race. So just some words of encouragement from some judges. And that seems to be the end of the races. So we're just waiting now for some judges' deliberation. I believe there should be some announcements being made as well. 
just have to wait and see. This is really exciting stuff, folks. So just don't go too far. We should have the results soon. So one thing to take from these races is, in general, with engineering, you know, there's a lot of learning to be done. So it's with these competitions that we really do see the true spirit of engineering, the dedication, the, the ingenuity, what teams are willing to do to innovate, to adapt, to overcome. So I believe that's the most important thing. That's the most, that's the most important thing we've learned today. So just always remember to try. And I believe yesterday we were told from one of the judges that engineers are essentially superheroes just trying to to work through and get to, to going through their lives going through their stories and this is one of those moments where the heroes in jeopardy but we always seem to pull through and they will do in this case nevertheless an exciting round of races so stay tuned folks as we should have some final decisions coming up soon Okay, folks, I'm joined with Elisa, chair of the GLR competition. Um, Elisa, you've just seen the round of races uh, with all five teams here. So what exactly is going through your mind? What's happening? So, yeah, I was there uh, timing and uh, helping out the, the judges on the lanes. It was quite tough. We had uh, some disappointments because some of the devices were not functioning or they, they were not supposed uh, to start when they had to start. So this is part of the competition, but uh, we recognize the team's efforts. So what's happening now? The judges, they, they made notes of all the scores. So they just went to the judge's briefing room to, to sum up all the scores and to decide who are the, what are the teams that are going to compete head to head into the grand final very soon. Excellent. So, uh, folks, we should be back soon with some results. 
after the judges have deliberated, so don't go too far. And some really exciting results. So we should see who the winner is very soon.
Okay, we would like to call uh, the teams for the finals now. Can we have a Kingston C, sorry, Kingston C, <laughs> UCL C and Kingston A, please, to the lanes to compete head to head? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so for those of you who have just joined us, we've just heard this is the grand finale. Essentially what's happened is the judges have gone and deliberated the three top teams, UCL Team C, C Team C and Team D, as well as Kingston University are racing for that grand final. Kingston University in the short range race, Team C for UCL in the medium, and Team D in the long range. My apologies, I'm just hearing now that it will be two teams, UCL Team C and Kingston University. Uh, Racing for the grand final, in the grand finals, Kingston University, UCL C. So just some last minute adjustments, some precision setting for their devices. months of preparation, preparing for this one moment. <clears throat> We're just seeing some adjustments being made by UCL Team C. It's, this race, these races have really been exciting. And so we're just seeing the results of these, of the setup now. Just final settings. Remember, they do have two minutes to set up the races. You have one minute left. What is 
So the question on everyone's mind at the moment is, after having two, after after having their successful runs, what could be the sources of error for the final runs? We've seen that Kingston University, with their with their slow but steady yet slow and steady, we we tend to know from the old moniker, slow and steady wins the race. UCL Team C, just going to have to see what happens. Both teams starting off. Kingston University, well off. UCL C, just going over the bullseye, scanning, successfully hitting the wall. Now we're seeing them go back to their original position. Good run thus far for UCL C. Kingston University, a lot of pressure on this one. Successfully hitting that mark and reversing back to the original position. Let's see if it will just rest on the bullseye or go back. And successful. Kingston University resetting UCLC, just trying to land back on that bullseye mark. And they've gone just a little shy of the bullseye, but nevertheless, a good score. And it's actually just reversed. Wow. You can never expect what to, what to see at these races. So UCLC back on the bullseye. Excellent. Kingston University with one minute left. Slow but steady. Approaching the bullseye mark. UCLC, excellent. Excellent run. And Kingston slowly coming back to that final rest. And they've landed on the bullseye. An excellent run. Excellent coverage. So we're just waiting now for both teams. An excellent task. As you can see, applause, applause all across the board. Excellent work, both teams, really. So this has been months in the making for both teams. And with these two teams in the final stage of this grand finale, we'll have to see which team takes it home. Again, two more attempts for gold. They should be switching between lanes in a moment. And now rotation. Successful runs for both teams. We'll hope, we can only hope to see that they repeat the success they've had here in the upcoming races. So now Kingston University just setting up on the long distance as well as UCLC setting up on the short range. Now with Kingston University, with the speed, we have seen that long range can be difficult for them, but they are, remember, nevertheless, slow but steady. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. Both teams setting up. Complete silence in the crowds. A moment of high suspense for both teams. UCLC just making sure that their device is laser, laser accurate. just have to wait and see how the race when the races begin both teams ready both teams starting their devices successfully moving both teams it's an excellent start for both teams and UCLC has made contact as well as scanning the bullseye now just returning back to its original position Kingston University a third of the way there. And UCLC now going towards the bullseye. And it appears they've they've hit the mark. Excellent. 
excellent run from UCLC. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's got the big eyes. Kingston University, nevertheless, slow and steady, two thirds of the length of the long range completed. Although the races are slow, they are, there are moments of really high suspense in these races. So we're just waiting to see Kingston University's robot with one minute left, not having made contact with the wall just yet. They've just scanned. They've just scanned the bullseye. So now they've made contact. A successful contact has been made. So now it's just reversing with less than a minute left to go. We're just waiting to see. Okay, and their device having stopped on the bullseye. We'll have to wait and see. And the coding has taken over. The device now stops on the bullseye, just moving forward. And it's lined up. A successful run from both Kingston University and UCLC. Excellent, excellent work. It appears with Kingston University, with the short and medium range race, racing, the device essentially scans the bullseye. With short, it will go back to the original position. With long, it will scan, go back to the, to the bullseye that it wants to go back onto and just move a little bit forward, which is an excellent design option because with that speed and, that, and the amount of time left, it, if it were to go back to the original position, it would be, it would be a problem. But we'll just have to wait and see. Kingston University, UCLC, just setting up. This is the last port. This is their last attempt at the grand final. Both teams showing excellent work, resilience, and ingenuity with their designs. This is a moment of high, high suspense. Both teams just setting up now. UCLC just making sure that their device is perfectly in line. Kingston University just giving some final looks, making sure their devices are perfectly on the mark. Both teams just getting ready to set up. Minor adjustments being made. These races are always moments of high intensity. I suppose the closest I could compare this to would be perhaps a golf tournament or something, but slow, steady, but anything could go wrong, which is why your eyes are always on the prize and on the racetrack. You notice a lot of personality with these devices, some of them faster than others, some of them slower. Nevertheless, you can never know what to expect. One minute remaining on setup. UCLC just making some minor adjustments, ensuring that their device is in line. Remember, they're on the long range part portion of it. So any mistakes will be more apparent. Both teams showing excellent runs in their previ previous races. It all comes down to this. A possible failure could mean deduction of points. So high suspense. Both teams ready. We're just getting ready to start in a moment. Both teams starting Kingston University with a successful start and UCLC with a successful start. We're seeing Kingston University doing the long range, showing excellent speed, precision, and Kingston University covering half of the race distance for the medium range race. Kingston University successfully making contact with the wall, completed scanning of the bullseye mark, now just returning back to the original position Kingston University now just approaching the bullseye mark. So we should see it scanning, making contact with the wall, and hopefully returning. 
UCLC approaching the bullseye. Excellent. We did see that this was an op was an issue previously with, with previous teams where their device overshot the bullseye and came off the racetrack, but not the case in this situation. Again, a lot of suspense. Kingston University seems to have since have it seems to have stopped. We'll just have to wait and see if this is a technical error or it's just a momentary glitch. And UCLC, unfortunately, Kingston University seems to have stopped dead in its tracks. And it seems exactly where the track has joins up as may have may have been the issue for that. Nevertheless, UCLC completing a successful run. We'll just have to wait and see what the judges say about this. Remember, with the scanning, these devices essentially are, are scanning to, to differentiate between colors. So any forms of differences in the track could affect the code. We'll just have to wait and see. And that seems to be all, folks. Kingston University, an unsuccessful run. Heartbreaking moments, but nevertheless, they've, they've put in a lot of heart and effort into this. UCLC completing all runs successfully. Really was a very, very close competition. We'll just have to wait and see the judges deliberating to see who wins this. UCLC, Kingston University, or any of the other teams. We'll just have to wait and see. Really an excellent race for all. You can hear murmurs in the crowd, everyone excited. Ladies and gentlemen, just wait to see. High stress. So we should be back in a moment with more from Elisa, our chair. Just have to wait and see, folks. I think the middle, the middle one, isn't it? It's like a movie. 
Bro, I, I'm not gonna lie, I was about to wear it. I put it out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with Elisa. Um, Elisa, what, can you tell us what's going on in the judges' room right now? Right, so they are deciding uh, not only on the overall winner of the whole competition, but also uh, on the other elements, such as the best poster, Okay, because they're also competing on that. The best card model, the best presentation. Um, so this is all part of this competition. And uh, the students are really curious and really looking forward to see who is going to get the trophy today for the second day of this competition, which has been quite tough. We, we, we had um, very strong teams today and uh, interesting designs once again. The finals were easy for ones and very tough for the others, as you could see. But let's see. Let's see what results we are going to get. Thank you very much, Elisa. And, that, and for now, just remain at your seats, folks, because we're just coming up with a judge's decision soon. So don't go too far. Thank you. Thank you.
day for us.
Okay. Okay, everyone, can you all take your seats? We are going to be announcing the winners of the last day of the GLR iMac Design Challenge. Can you please take your seats? I think we have everyone here, right? I just wanted to say well done. It's been a long day. Uh, you should be very, very proud of your work. I know how hard it is to deal with a lot of deadlines. You've been through the exams period as well. When, why are you doing, you'll be doing this work. So be really proud, okay? Okay, so let's go to the part because you might want to to go and then have some, some food or doing anything else, right? You just don't want to be here me anymore. <laughs> okay, so uh, the first element that I'm going to announce for today is the, the winners for the design review. So for third place, we have Kingston Team A. Well done. Oh, sorry, that's uh, the wrong. Uh, sorry, sorry, it's the wrong one. Oh. <laughs> Just take a photo. Yeah. yeah. The... Sorry. <laughs> well done. Thank you. For the second place, we have UCLD. For the post at UCLD, you can come back because you got the third place as well. So well done. <laughs> if you want another fault. <laughs> Just, yeah, if you want. Okay, yeah, so just forever. Okay. And then for the competition, there is no third. Okay. So when you're going to the So which one do you want me to ask for? Okay, for presentation, we got second place uh, UCLD. Yeah. And uh, for peer review, uh, UCLD.
for the overall winner for the competition, we have UCLC. So very quick one from me. Really, really happy to, to see all the teams here trying to, to do their best in the competition and just being here in the middle of your exams with all your products, with all the struggles that you got. It was, it was really, really uh, interesting. Uh, it's not normal to get five uh, uh, teams in the, um, in the advanced regional. So again, thank you very much for all your effort. You should all be proud because you achieved something that uh, your colleagues didn't, didn't manage to, to get through by, just by being here. So. Again, thank you very much. Uh, I wish you all the best, and we hope that you learned something today. Um, it is a little bit sad. So yesterday we got just one team going to, to the final, and today we got, again, only one team going to the final. But I'm afraid it's the, it's the natural of a competition. So don't be, don't be put down. And please uh, try again in any other event, in other, any other stuff where you think you could learn something more for your future and for your career. So again, thank you very much. And now uh, I believe that we have some... some Refreshment uh, offered by the uni. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you much for saying thank you very much for joining us for the IMECI 2024 Design Challenge. For, if you've been with us for the first and the second day today, thank you very much. Uh, we've just seen our ch our champions crowned UCL Team C. Everyone's very excited, uh, and hopefully we'll get to see you soon next year um, for the IMECI Design Challenge as well. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next year. <laughs>